All right, now on to one of my favorite chapters in all of physical geology, and that is geologic time. Uh, this is a cool picture that I think illustrates geologic time really nicely. This is a picture from Acadia National Park in Maine, and I think it's cool because you can see these mountains in the background, the Acadian Mountains, which were formed over 300 million years ago, and you can probably notice how rounded they are. They're rounded by glaciation that occurred about 20,000 years ago. And then you see where some of those rocks from the erosion of these mountains were dropped here 10,000 years ago. And then, of course, there's regular processes that are occurring just in the present. So I think it's cool how geologic time is a way to look at all of the different things that have happened in a landscape at, at one period of time. Um, and kind of try to unravel it almost like a like a big giant puzzle piece. There's two main parts to this chapter on geologic time and the first one is called relative time. Um, relative time is the process of placing events in the order of their occurrence. I'm a big believer in analogies and um, in my face-to-face -face class we have a very long conversation about this awkward family photo which is wildly entertaining um, and basically, I ask them to look at the picture, figure out who is in the family, and put them in order from oldest to youngest. And I chose this picture intentionally because it is very mysterious. Um, most of the conversation centers around this person and this person's relationship to the rest of the family, and we never get to consensus. Um, but if you were standing with me, my mother, and my daughter, you would be able to tell which one of us was oldest, who was next in age and who was youngest. And that's really what you do with relative time is there's just some very basic principles where you look at a cross section of rocks and you put things in order in the event in which they occur. There's no actual ages. You wouldn't know the actual age of my mother or my daughter or myself, but you would know who was oldest, who was next, and then who was youngest. So your first activity actually uses this uh, block diagram where you will look at a series of events that transpired that formed all of these different rock layers. Um, you'll learn about the principles and then you'll get to apply the principles right away. Um, and for the most part, they're pretty logical, I think. Um, things that you might wanna know is that this unit, number two, is an igneous unit. You can see that it cuts across all the surrounding rock layers. Number three is also an igneous unit. You can see that that cuts up and melts its way up through rock layers. And then there's a fault here, layer which is labeled fault B where there has been motion and offset of some of these rock layers. So if you want to pause now and try it, that's cool. Otherwise, I'm going to keep talking about all the ways that geologists can have to sort of fill in some of the gaps in the rock record. So this is actually just a really cool picture outside of Lake George, New York, but I think it illustrates how, um, and it shows some remelting of rock layer as a result of the intrusion of this black magma that intruded into the pinkish rock layer here. Um, and I think it's something that as geologists we have to grapple with a lot, and that is that there's a lot of ways that we can lose rock record. Anytime rocks get eroded, or there's mass wasting, where rocks fall down the slope, like we're losing bits of information. There's this fantastic author, John McPhee, and he's not a geologist, but he really likes geologists, and he hangs out with them, and then he writes about um, their expeditions from his perspective. And he wrote in this book called Basin and Range that geology is kind of like trying to tell a story that's 100 pages long and you have like 97 of the pages missing. And you have just a few clues to tell your story with. One of the reasons that geologists don't have all the pages to that story is because of unconformities. Unconformities are breaks or gaps in the rock record. Typically, the, there are gaps in the rock record because of erosion or because of a process called non-deposition, um, where basically sediment is just routed somewhere else. Typically, though, you're, we're talking about erosion of sediment. There are three main types of unconformities, and again, these are just three ways that rock can be missing from the rock record, and we have to acknowledge that as part of telling the geologic story of an area. So, the first of those three ways that we can find evidence for missing um, time is a process called, an, or feature rather, called an angular unconformity. So, angular unconformities can be recognized when we find tilted rock layers that are sedimentary. 
and they are overlain by flat lying rock layers. So they're actually at a very different angle. So this next couple of slides kind of illustrate how an angular unconformity can form. So here we have a typical uh, marine environment where there are five layers of sedimentary rock that have been deposited. The oldest one is on the bottom, the young, and that's number one. The youngest rock layer is on the top, and that is number four. And you'll notice that sea level is kind of high in this particular diagram. In the next diagram, we can see that sea level has dropped and the rock layers have been tilted upwards. What happens now is that the highest elevations typically experience the fastest weathering rates. And when that happens, we see erosion in this diagram of some of these rock layers. So you can see that rock layer five is almost completely eroded away. And so is a good deal of rock layer four, some of rock layer three, and even a bit of rock layer two. Notice sea level is still low here. Then we can go through a period of sea level rise in this diagram. And what you see is that once again, when sea level is high, we start to have deposition of sedimentary rocks again above this erosional surface. The erosional surface is the angular unconformity right here. And all geologists have to note is when they find a rock layer like oh. this. Oh. So when geologists come across a situation where they see tilted rocks here that are overlain by flat lying rocks here, this contact right here is the site of erosion and that is the angular unconformity. So sea level might rise and fall like this. Can you think of reasons why? Um, the most obvious reason why is really due to ice sheets, um, glaciers that are growing and then melting away. Um, and so typically that will occur when you have, um, when ice sheets are growing, you have sea level falling because a lot of ocean seawater is stored on land in the form of ice and sea level falls. Conversely then, when ice sheets melt, sea level will rise and when sea level rises, um, you start to see some of the deposition like you see in diagrams one and four like this. So this is one way that geologists can recognize a gap in the geologic record. The hardest unconformity to recognize is called a disconformity. So disconformities are also largely the result of fluctuations in sea level, but they don't involve any tilting of rock layers like we see. So in this first diagram, sea level is high, and we have the deposition of one, two, three, four rock layers. Then perhaps we go through an ice age and sea level drops. What you can see is that when sea level drops that this purplish layer has been completely eroded away, as well as some of this yellow layer. So that's a gap in the geologic record. The next thing that can happen is that sea level rises once again, and here between the yellow layer and this green layer is where you have our erosional surface or our disconformity. So again, we've lost layers of rock. And so that's part of the geologic story that we can't necessarily tell. Um, so the way that you recognize a disconformity, which is just missing layers um, between sedimentary rock layers that represent a period of erosion, is sometimes you'll have like chunks of this eroded rock and they'll be included. So sometimes this purple rock here, you might find chunks of it in the base of this green layer here. Sometimes you'll actually see a really irregular surface between the yellow and the green layer. And sometimes there'll be a mineral deposit or something to mark the location of a disconformity. Uh, but they're tricky. They're definitely very tricky to identify. Your third and final type of unconformity is called a nonconformity. And a nonconformity occurs when you have sediment, or sorry, when you have igneous or metamorphic rocks in contact with sedimentary rocks along an erosional surface. So in this first diagram, we have the cooling of a magma chamber, maybe a batholith in, the is, in this location is cooling. And you can see that this is a completely plutonic rock. It's all intrusive. But then over time, and you can see that sea level is low here, we have erosion of the surface. And eventually all of these rock layers that are deposited, that were formed on, already on top of the igneous intrusion are completely eroded away and the granite because that's typically the composition of batholiths, is exposed at the surface. And when that happens, you have a lot of erosion, as you can see here. When sea level maybe is high, 
at a later point in time, you can have deposition of sedimentary rocks on top of that erosional surface. And here, just like I mentioned on the last slide, you can find chunks of this batholith or this igneous rock that are found in the base of this green layer here. Um, again, indicating that there has been some erosion. So this can occur when you see igneous rocks that are in contact with sedimentary rocks. It can also occur if you have metamorphic rocks that are in contact with sedimentary rocks, especially if you have, for example, some contact metamorphism that took place between the igneous rock and the surrounding rock layer that will create metamorphic rocks. When you see those in contact with sedimentary rock layers and you can find the erosional surface, that is called a nonconformity. I will tell you that students frequently confuse nonconformities and disconformities. Nonconformities are not the same rock type. Disconformities are just between sedimentary layers, and um, one of my colleagues likes to describe them as being horizontal, like the disks of your back, disconformity and like disks of your back. I hope that's helpful to you. Um, students typically do not have a hard time um, identifying angular unconformities just because they're so distinctive. So your next acti activity actually talks about um, the three types of unconformities and you look back at that same diagram and use that to kind of figure out where the unconformities are. Another tool we have in identifying the age of rock layers is through paleontology, the study of fossils. Um, fossils are any trace or remain of life, so they can include a whole bunch of different things, which we'll talk about on the next couple slides. This is a really cool spot. This is in Dinosaur State Park in Connecticut, and in 1966, there was a new state building that was being put in in Connecticut. The um, construction workers just happened to hit this slab of um, sandstone and found, lo and behold, about 2,000 dinosaur footprints that were created when dinosaurs sort of frolicked in a floodplain um, in a shallow body of water. And um, they didn't really know what to do about it, but they thought it was really cool. You can see that there's actually some, so there's like carnivorous dinosaurs. There are also plenty of herbivores and then also some cool little alligator tracks too. Um, so what state officials did was they just kind of put a dome over it and they made it a park um, and you can go see it there. I ended up randomly being in Connecticut and, and seeing this several years ago. Um, and this is an example of one type of fossil. There are actually many types of fossils. So some are where the entire animal, flesh included, gets preserved. This is sort of a famous fossil. This is called Otzi the Iceman. Um, he's from the Italian Alps and um, Otzi basically was being chased away from an Italian village. He had been attacked. He had a big, um, I believe he had like an arrow in his back. Um, he also had a club foot. He had Lyme disease. He had a lot of medical problems that scientists could all identify because when he fled to the Italian Alps up in the high elevations, he froze them to death ultimately. And all of his body parts for the most part have been preserved. So scientists have been able to study him in some detail. Um, it's very rare that that happens, although there are some cases of like baby woolly mammoths falling into mud pits in Siberia and then being sort of frozen in the permafrost um, that they get discovered probably every five to ten years or so. Sometimes um, organisms, especially trees, can be petrified or replaced cell by cell by silica. So this might look familiar. This is actually a petrified log and it's composed of agate, which is a variety of chert. Um, which is one of your sedimentary rock layers. And this is formed in Petrified um, Forest National Park in Arizona. Basically, there was a forest and it was buried in volcanic ash due to a volcanic eruption. The volcanic eruption had a lot of tuff in it. Tuff is full of silica. And trees continued to suck groundwater out of the soil after the volcanic um, ash had fallen and it sucked the silica up into the tree. The silica replaced the tree cell by cell, preserving the interior, or sorry, not so much the interior as the exterior of the wood that you can see here millions of years later. Sometimes the mold and sometimes the cast of an organism is preserved. This is a trilobite. It's a really common fossil to find in, um, in New England, certainly, but also in like Ohio and Pennsylvania. 
Um, trilobites are really common in the geologic record. This is a mold of a trilobite. So this preserves the exterior the, or the exoskeleton of the trilobite where the organism died and its exoskeleton created this imprint and you can see that sort of the, it preserves the outside of the shell. Um, a cast preserves the inside of an organism. So if you ever see a clam and it dies and it just opens up just a touch, not quite fully open, sometimes sand will fill the inside of that clam and it will create an outline that will illustrate where the interior sort of organs, as it were, of the clam are preserved. And sometimes um, you can have, typically with plants, a process called carbonization. Carbonization is basically in a low oxygen environment when a plant falls in really quiet water where there's very little oxygen, um, the plant never really decomposes. And so the carbon that is trapped inside the plant kind of becomes almost burned onto the mud or the clay below. And so you can see that in this fern fossil here, um, basically that the carbon is never really uh, decomposed and returned to the carbon system. So those are some examples of fossils. Others include trace fossils, like trackways or burrows. So this is Dinosaur Ridge National Monument. Um, these folks are doing actually really cool math on what the stride length was of certain dinosaurs to do calculations and figure out what velocity the dinosaurs were walking or running at the time um, that these trackways were created. Other evidence of life can include things like fossilized dung, which are called coprolites. And coprolites can tell you all sorts of things about the lifestyle of an organism. It can tell you if they lived together or in a solitary way. Um, it can tell you if they went to the bathroom wherever or if they had sort of designated spots for it. It can also reveal to you something about the diet of the organism. Um, so fossils are really important in a different principle of uh, relative dating that we had, than we've talked about yet. It's called the principle of faunal succession. It's sometimes called fossil succession too. Basically, it's the idea that you can figure out what age a rock is based on its fossil content. So for example, if you found a rock layer with a dinosaur fossil in it, and then in general, that rock layer was deposited when dinosaurs were alive. Dinosaurs were only alive from about 250 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. So that's the relative age of that rock. Now, if you could tell what dinosaur it was, you could narrow that range even more. So that's the principle of faunal succession, the idea that we can figure out the age of a rock layer based on its fossil content. At this point, this is the end of our discussion of relative time. So there's, um, after this activity with um, unconformities, there will be a, another lecture on absolute time, which is when you can look at a rock layer and figure out the actual age of it, not whether it's older or younger than something, but that it was formed 105 million years ago, for example. And that involves isotopes, which is something that we talked about many weeks ago in chapter three. Stay tuned.